the Teutonic Knights, one of the most recognizable military orders of the Crusades. While the Templars and Hospitallers are most often associated with the Holy Land, the Teutonic Knights will forever evoke the grim forest battles of the Northern Crusades. The Teutonic Order drove the success of the Baltic Crusades in their relentless wars to subdue the pagan Prussians. However, the Teutonic Knights were active on many fronts. They participated in the Holy Land Crusades, fought alongside the Latin Empire, and later even fought against former allies such as Poland. Today, we'll look at five noteworthy battles of the Teutonic Knights, taken from various phases in their history and various theaters of war. From the Holy Land to the Baltic North, from Achaia to Poland to Lithuania, join us. The Teutonic Knights were the war machines of their time, and before we get into their story, it's time to command your own tank in War Machines, a fast-paced, action-packed shooter that puts you in control of over 30 realistic battle tanks. It's a free mobile game with over 150 million downloads and more than 400,000 active monthly users that immerses you in a thrilling world where rapid decisions and strategic moves determine victory or defeat in real-time tank battles. Plus, in a few days you'll be able to play with characters from the new Expendables movie, each with their own design and abilities. Starting September 22nd, Expendables from Lionsgate and Millennium Media is a must-see in theaters with big action, huge stars, and awesome fight scenes. Join unique Expendables events. Expendables seasonal content will help you beat your enemies and delve ever deeper into the world of War Machines. Click on my link in the description box or use the QR code on screen and get War Machines today. Number 5. The Battle of Ryzen, 1233 The Teutonic Knights first entered Prussia at the invitation of the Polish Duke Conrad of Masovia. Conrad wanted to stop his eastern border from being attacked by the pagan tribes of the Prussian wilderness. In response to Conrad's request, a force of Teutonic Knights arrived on the fringes of Prussia in 1230. On the south bank of the Vistula River, the Knights established their first Prussian fortress, called Vogelsong, or Birdsong, so named by the German crusaders because there sang many a wounded man, not as the nightingale sings, but with the sorrowful song that the swan sings as he is killed. Reinforcements arrived under Master Hermann von Balk. Von Balk was a reasonable, approachable man when dealing with Christians. William Urban says that he showed equal regard toward his German, Polish, and even converted Prussian followers. However, when it came to pagans, Hermann von Balk was ruthless and uncompromising. Over the years, German and Polish crusaders joined the Teutonic Brothers in pressing deeper into Prussia, establishing new castles to expand crusader power. In 1231, Thorn was raised opposite Vogelsong. Then, in 1233, a major crusader army, composed mostly of Germans and Poles, gathered for a summer campaign. Many of these men were inspired by a relic of the true cross possessed by the Teutonic Order. The great achievement of this army was the building of Marienwerder to the northeast in Pomesania, halfway between Thorn and the sea, on a tributary of the Vistula. Most of the army then returned home, but many crusaders stayed for a winter campaign. The Polish Duke Sventapelk of Pomeralia led a substantial force alongside the Teutonic brothers in a full-on invasion of Pomesania. To counter the advance of the Crusaders, the Prussian tribes of Pomesania assembled an army. On the frozen surface of the Sorge River, the pagans encountered the Teutonic coalition. The Pomesanians, lightly armored and mostly on foot, adopted a phalanx formation. However, the Prussians were surprised when Duke Sventapelk appeared with his cavalry to their rear. The Polish Duke had concealed his position and sprung the perfect trap. Facing heavy cavalry to their front and their back, the Prussians panicked and fled. 
However, Sventapelk had set up obstacles to the rear of the Prussians, slowing their retreat. The Crusaders annihilated the Pomisanians. It was one of the earliest in what would be many grim, bloody battles over the course of the Prussian Crusade. This early victory established a pattern. Every year, new Crusader armies arrived to assist the Teutonic Brothers. After conquering territory and raising castles, the Crusaders returned home while the Teutonic Brothers held the new conquests through the bitter winter. Although badly defeated in this early encounter, the pagan Prussians began adapting to Teutonic tactics and weapons. Soon, the Prussians mastered the weapons of the Latin Christians and began to develop some counters to heavy cavalry. Number 4. The Battle of St. George, 1320 For our next battle, we'll travel almost a century into the future and to a different theater of war, the Latin Principality of Achaia and its struggle with the Byzantine Empire of Constantinople. Here, the Teutonic Knights played a role in the military establishments of the Latins. The Fourth Crusade had established a Latin Empire in the heart of Byzantium. Constantinople was held by the Latins until 1261, when it was retaken by the Byzantines. One vassal of the Latin Empire did endure for considerably longer, the Principality of Achaia, which controlled most of the Morea, the Peloponnesian Peninsula in southern Greece. But the Principality's stability wavered after 1315, when multiple claimants struggled for the princely throne. The Duke of Burgundy contested the claim of the Angevins of Naples. Meanwhile, an Angevin governor, Frederick Trogissio, ruled the principality while the matter was disputed. This opportunity roused Andronikos Asen, governor of the Byzantine province of Mistris in southeastern Morea, and nephew of the Emperor Andronikos II Paleologos himself. The emperor had wisely granted Asen broad powers in the province, and the governor energetically pursued the conquest of the Latin principality. In 1320, Asen raised an army and invaded Arcadia, the central portion of Morea. There, he besieged the Latin fortress of St. George, one of many castles guarding the pass through the mountains of Scorta. In response, Frederick Trogissio assembled the Principality's vassals to relieve St. George. The Bishop of Olena, James of Cyprus, the Teutonic Knights, and the Knights Hospitaller all brought contingents to join Frederick's campaign. Hearing of the approaching Latins, Austin intensified his attack on St. George. He managed to convince Niccolo of Patras, the castle's Greek castellan, to surrender on September 9. Occupying St. George, Austin left the Latin banners flying from the towers. When Frederick Trogissio arrived, he thought the Greeks had fled and advanced with his forces toward the castle. But as the Latin army approached, Austin sprang his trap, launching a surprise attack. A fierce battle ensued. The Latins had been unprepared and were unable to overcome the Greek forces. The Teutonic Knights fought hard alongside their comrades, but their master himself fell in the melee. The Byzantines triumphed. Austin's 1320 campaign established Byzantine control of the Arcadian Plateau, reducing the Principality of Achaia to the northern and western coasts of Morea. Arcadia, which had been a bulwark of the Latin defenses, was once again in Byzantine hands. Number 3. The Battle of Rudau, 1370 For our next battle, we'll continue to press forward in time. Now, to 1370, we return to the Northern Crusades and the struggle between the Teutonic Knights and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. By now, the Teutonic Brothers had fully conquered Prussia and turned it into a powerful monastic state. Since the 1290s, the order had focused on subduing the pagan Duchy of Lithuania. Each side would launch campaigns against the other, with retaliations often quick to follow. The Lithuanian duchy was led by the Grand Duke Algirdas and his brother and chief field commander Kestutis. 
to turn the aims of the order's mission against them. Algirdas and Castutus would often express an interest in baptism just when the Teutonic Knights gained an advantage and then complained that the order was inhibiting their conversion with its attacks. At such times, the church generally pressed the Teutonic brothers to agree to a peace, at which point Algirdas and Castutus would regroup, rebuild, and then go to war yet again. It was shrewd and well played by the Lithuanian Grand Duke and his brother. One episode in particular made Castutus a Lithuanian folk hero. In 1361, Castutus was captured in battle by the Grand Master, Vinrik von Kniprode, and held prisoner within the Teutonic fortress of Marienburg. However, with the help of a Lithuanian servant working in the castle, Castutus made his escape. He stole a white cloak, climbed a chimney, and wearing the cloak like a Teutonic brother, slipped unnoticed through the courtyard. Near the gate, he found the Grand Master's horse, saddled and waiting. He leaped onto the steed, rode at breakneck pace, and escaped into friendly territory. The conflict came to a head in February 1370, when Algirdas and Castutus invaded Teutonic-held Samland. Vinrik von Kniprode quickly gathered forces from across the monastic state to assemble a formidable army. Algirdas and Castutus were ravaging the countryside near Rudau when the crusader host was suddenly upon them. Castutus withdrew at once, but Algirdas took a position on a wooded hill and prepared for battle. The Teutonic Knights attacked, and a long, bloody clash ensued. Ultimately, Algirdas was overcome. Casualties for the Lithuanians were considerable, likely numbering in the thousands. The Grand Master lost several hundred troops, among them 26 brother knights who were not easily replaced, including the Marshal. This was a reality for the Order, whose elite knights, their most valuable units, were almost always at the forefront of the fighting. Algirdas escaped with his life, never again to invade Prussia. The Order attributed the victory to the Virgin Mary. Number 2. The Battle of Grunwald, 1410 We'll continue to move forward in time to perhaps the most famous engagement in the history of the Teutonic Knights, the Battle of Grunwald in 1410, amid the Polish-Lithuanian Teutonic War. Through much of the Prussian Crusade, the Teutonic Knights were helped by Polish allies. But then, the brothers acquired Pomerelia, or West Prussia, in the early 1300s with its eastern border on the Vistula River. For the Polish kings, Pomeralia was Polish land, and they could not accept this. Finally, at the end of the 14th century, the Teutonic brothers were in conflict with the Lithuanians over Samogitia. Various peace agreements kept the conflict at bay, but in 1409, a Samogitian rebellion brought the conflict to a head. Grand Master Ulrich von Unigen, a hardliner who felt that the order had grown too lax, demanded that the Poles and Lithuanians cease giving aid to the Samogitians. Peace was not out of the question. The Pope and other leading figures in Christendom urged a reconciliation so that Europe could stand united against the Ottomans in Hungary. Both sides argued the righteousness of their case. The Teutonic Knights portrayed the Lithuanians as false Christians who'd inhibited the mission of the brothers, while the Poles and the Lithuanians cast the order as a power-seeking husk of its once righteous incarnation. The King of Poland, Władysław, summoned the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Vitutis, to join him in Masovia. By mid-June 1410, the Polish king had assembled an army of some 30,000, including 18,000 Polish cavalry and around 11,000 Lithuanians. Grand Master Ulrich assembled an enormous army as well, around 20,000 strong, including a substantial number of Bohemian crusaders. Ulrich divided his forces between East and West Prussia, awaiting invasion in a defensive posture. He placed Heinrich von Plauen with 3,000 men on the Vistula to protect West Prussia. The Grand Master's plan was to deny the enemy plunder and exhaust their supplies, while the Teutonic forces remained well-positioned and well-supplied. 
Leading up to this, on July 1st, Władysław and Vitutis rendezvoused at Cherdysk on the Vistula, then rapidly advanced northward, their armies reinforced by Czech, Moravian, Wallachian, and Tatar mercenaries. When Grand Master Ulrich heard this, he set out to find a suitable place to meet the enemy in the southern forest and lake region before the invaders could ravage the farmlands in the river valleys. Both commanders showed remarkable discipline, advancing toward one another cautiously. King Władysław was a naturally calm and controlled personality, maintaining poise throughout the campaign. He didn't drink, and his love of hunting meant he was at home in the lightly inhabited forests. Władysław obtained intelligence that a road existed toward Osterode, which might allow them to bypass the Grand Master's fortified position. The Polish king hoped to lure the Teutonic Knights east. When Ulrich heard that the invaders had moved as far as Gilgenberg and had torched the city, he was enraged. He decided to leave his strong position and make a quick night march with the hope of achieving a surprise attack. The two armies finally met at the fields between the villages of Grunwald and Tannenberg. So far, the Grand Master had achieved his aim. He'd brought his army upon the Poles and Lithuanians without warning, but he'd wasted his advantage. A night attack launched immediately might have overwhelmed the Polish king's unprepared troops. Instead, the Grand Master waited until dawn and withdrew from his initial line to allow the Polish cavalry to advance forward. The Grand Master hoped to lure the Polish knights into attacking first thus allowing the Teutonic Cavalry to disrupt Władysław's formations with one of their famous counter-charges. Instead, the Lithuanian Cavalry executed an attack, followed by a feigned retreat, which drew the Crusader Auxiliaries into a premature pursuit. Concealed Polish knights sprang onto the pursuing Crusaders, who then themselves fled, while the Lithuanians and Poles drove straight into the disordered Crusader ranks. This was a critical moment. The Teutonic lines were disrupted, but the day wasn't yet lost. The Grand Master probably should have commanded a general withdrawal to preserve his army and regroup. Instead, he gathered his brother knights and launched a charge straight at the Polish center, hoping to threaten the king. It was characteristic of Ulrich to bet everything on a single heroic charge. His gamble failed. Vitutis reinforced the Polish king's cavalry, surrounded and crushed the Grand Master's attack. There, Ulrich and many of his high-ranking knights went down in a bloody, ferocious brawl. With the Grand Master dead, the Teutonic army collapsed into a panicked rout. The Poles and the Lithuanians pursued and cut down what remained of their enemy. Number 1. The Siege of Marienborg, 1410 Poland and Lithuania's victory had been outstanding. After the exhaustion of the battle and the pursuit, the King of Poland allowed his men to rest for three days. Then he advanced north. His target was Marienborg, the great commanding fortress of the Teutonic Order. If the king could take that stronghold, he would be well positioned to subdue all of Prussia. Many local towns and forts were already surrendering, and the king dispatched men to find the body of the Grand Master so that it could be given an honorable Christian burial. The king and the Grand Duke seemed on the verge of total triumph. Vitotus was ready to seize all the lands east of the Vistula. Władysław prepared to impose the ancient Polish claim to Kolm and West Prussia. Then, when the Teutonic Order seemed on the verge of collapse, a man emerged to act decisively. Heinrich von Plauen. He was not a particularly remarkable brother of the Order, a simple Castellan. Years earlier, he'd come to Prussia as a crusader. Impressed by the Order's zeal, he renounced the world and became a warrior monk. Now, after the disaster of Grunwald, Heinrich alone took the initiative to salvage the Teutonic state. At once, he assembled 3,000 men at Marienborg and prepared the defenses of the key fortress before the Polish king could arrive. Most, if not all, of the Teutonic Order's officers in Prussia were dead. Von Plauen began to give orders while others hesitated. The surviving knights and crusaders, as well as local townspeople and settlers, gathered at Marienborg, rallying around Von Plauen. 
They stocked the fortress with bread, cheese, and beer, drove pigs inside the walls, and brought in fodder from the fields. They gathered guns and weapons, and removed obstructions from the field to provide a clear line of fire. When the Poles and Lithuanians arrived before Marienborg, they found the wall lined with defenders ready to fight. They also found the surrounding countryside stripped of food and supplies, all of which had been packed into Marienborg. Władysław had not wanted a long siege, but his only other option was to admit defeat. For eight weeks, Polish cannon and catapults pounded at the walls. Smaller fortresses in Prussia surrendered, but the key strongholds of Marienborg and Konigsberg held out, fiercely resisting. When dysentery spread through the besieging camp, Vitotis withdrew his forces, but Władysław held on to the hope that von Plauen and his dogged companions would soon crack. Meanwhile, help was on the way for the Teutonic Knights. An army of the Livonian branch of the order arrived at Konigsberg, and crusaders began to filter in from Germany and Hungary to form an army. Soon, a relieving army under Michael Kuchmeister routed Polish forces in West Prussia and quickly began to recover fortress after fortress. By September, the order was again firmly in control of West Prussia. The situation turned desperate in the Polish king's siege camp. His knights complained that their duration of service was expired. The king had no choice but to admit defeat. On September 19, he withdrew from the siege. Marienborg was saved, and along with it, the Teutonic state. Teutonic power had been revived after a moment of near total disaster. Nevertheless, in hindsight, many historians have noted that the order never fully recovered from its losses at the Battle of Grunwald. After the comeback victory at Marienborg, the future must have seemed bright. The order felt that they'd overcome the greatest of challenges in their darkest hour. The following century would prove to be one of slow decline for the order, in part because its original mission was all but ended. The Northern Crusades were effectively over. The old pagan frontier of the Northeast was no longer a frontier, but was now solidly part of Latin Christendom. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out War Machines, an awesome, fast paced, and free tank battle shooter for your mobile device. Click on the link in the description or use the QR code on screen to get War Machines now. Learn more about the warrior monks of the Crusades. Check out our documentary detailing seven of the most epic battles of the Knights Templar. Click on the video linked on your screen to watch right now. Also, if you liked the music in this video, check out my musical project, Roman Lion, linked on your screen right now.